What does it mean to truly live a full life? When you get to the end of your life, how will you be able to determine that you truly lived a full life? You live life to the fullest. This is this question. It's a, it's a popular question, um, especially online and lots of blogs out there of people trying to answer that question. And I would say that question is second only to another question. Uh, what is the purpose of life? As I looked on the internet and read some blogs of people trying to answer that question, what I found was that everyone was pretty much saying the same thing, different wording, different terms, but ultimately saying the same thing. And I'll, I'll give you two examples. Uh, Dr. Joe Meyer, a medical doctor at Fremantle Hospital in Western Australia, says this. He says, to live a fully life, means to be in the moment, awake and alive and able to enjoy things now, not worrying about the past or postponing happiness to a distant future. Claudia Fuji says this, she's a life coach, says to live fully, you need to take care of your mind, body and soul. I think that the secret is to balance this tripod through physical exercise that can help you to train and discipline yourself to achieve your life goals. Also, meditation or any other relaxing activity that can help you to keep you focused and also nurture your body with healthy food. Basically, uh, my definition of what people were saying from the research that, I, that from from gathering uh, blogs and, and the Internet, everyone was saying the same thing. And this, it's this to truly live is to daily seek and feed your mind, your body and your soul, your personal self-interest, letting no one deny you anything your heart desires in this present moment. And if you live like this, you might not receive all your desires, but you can say you lived a full life. Unfortunately, that's the man's or the or the, or or that's the man, the world's way of thinking. And this is what seekers and children of all ages, they when that question pops up, what it means to live, this is what they get, whether it's at school, whether it's through television, even some of their parents. I'm sure we can all agree that the encouragement of today from professors and motivational speakers is you need to live for yourself and you need to live for glory and pleasure. So don't just deny yourself anything if you can obtain it. But the word of God warned us about the times we are living in now. Second Timothy three, one through two says this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves. And we see this with Jesus and his disciples here in our passage this morning. So I want to give you a little context. Jesus has revealed that he is the Messiah to his disciples. He has also revealed the concept of the church to his disciples, that those who place their faith in Jesus, the Messiah, through the spirit will become the children of God and will live on mission for Jesus on earth until he returns. And when Jesus returns, he defeats his enemies and every knee will bow to Jesus one day and the church will reign with Jesus forever. Amen. Amen. So that's amazing news to the disciples, because at the time they are subjected to the rule and reign of the Romans. So they're pumped. They, they want this so bad. And you would, too, under the reign of a, a foreign country that hates you. They are ready to go to war behind their new King Jesus uh, against the Romans. And then Jesus starts to tell them his plan. And that's when things get weird. Look at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. The disciples are like, what? Jesus has to die. 
I thought the Romans would die. How are we going to take over the Romans if Jesus is dead? I don't, I don't like this plan, actually. The disciples, they didn't understand that Jesus, he would rescue them from the wrath of God that was upon them because they, they are sinners who have sinned against the holy God. You see, all people on earth have sinned against the one true holy God. This offense, it must be punished. And God says the punishment is eternal death. You see, the disciples, they didn't understand that their biggest issue wasn't their national slavery to the Romans, but their slavery to the God of this age, Satan. Satan caused Adam and Eve to sin. And we all have a sin nature now that tells us to live for our glory and not the glory of God. The disciples, they they didn't understand that Jesus first coming was in peace, offering his life so others could live. But that his second coming would be King Jesus destroying his enemies and reigning forever. And that's what we're awaiting now as the church. So they didn't understand. They didn't understand any of that. All they knew was that they were tired of being uncomfortable. They were tired of being denied their their desires. They were tired of being treated as lower class people, tired of serving, and they wanted to be served. Peter was the only one, and we pick on Peter a lot, but Peter was the only one that was brave enough to actually say something to Jesus. Look at verse 22. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. Peter says, hey, Jesus, can I, can I talk to you alone? Listen, Jesus, you know I'm, I'm your guy, right? I'm team Jesus all the way. But you're being a little too emotional right now. You're scaring the children. You're not going to die. Listen, Jesus, it's been a it's been a rough week. You're going to get some food. You're going to take a nap and you're going to wake up and be the king. We need you to be. It's time to go to war with Rome. Look at verse 23. How does Jesus respond? But he turned and said to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And then Jesus turns to his disciples, verse 24, and he says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, will find it. When the question is asked, what does it mean to follow Jesus? The definition Jesus gives us, it's interesting that it comes in the context of Jesus talking to people who were tired of being uncomfortable, uh, tired of being denied their desires, people who were tired of being lower class, people who wanted to be served. They were tired of serving. We live in a free country. We, We don't know how it feels to have another nation reigning over us. So here is their moment to come up from from under the foot of Rome that's been on their neck for a long time. And Jesus says to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Before we talk about what that means, I must say what this isn't. Uh, Well, this is a a countercultural response to the world from Jesus. Countercultural to the world because Jesus isn't of the world and neither are his children. So what does it mean to take up your cross? Does it mean to buy a cross or a necklace? It can't mean that because people wear crosses every day, yet they are far from God. They don't honor him with their lives and they only acknowledge him when they need him for something. So Jesus can't be saying we need new jewelry. Here's what it doesn't mean as well. It doesn't mean a burden that we must bear. Many say, well, I have this trial and I have to get through it and I got to carry my cross. This light bill is out of this world, but I must take up my cross. My wife or husband are the reason for my anxiety, but I must take up my cross. That's not what Jesus is saying. You got to understand something about the cross. 
Jesus is talking to first century Jews. When they thought about the cross, they didn't think about a burden because the cross represented death. It was a form of punishment. They literally saw friends and family members hanging from crosses for days. Even the Old Testament scripture said that anyone who hangs from a tree is cursed. So no, it's not a jewelry and it's not just a burden. What it is is a call to live like Jesus. Jesus loved others so much that he denied himself the glory of heaven. He humbled himself and came to earth to die for his enemies. Denied himself the honor and praise that he deserved and came to earth and became friends with sinners like you and me. So to, and to those who mock him, say he doesn't exist, he continues to let them live because he desires for them to be saved before they die with their sins unforgiven. What it is, it's a call to live in such a way that people know whose team you are on. The apostle Peter, he's seen by all means to be on the team Jesus, right? He came to Bible study. He, he came to service on the Sabbath. He praised Jesus. So by all human accounts, Peter was a disciple. But Jesus said this to Peter, for you are mindful of the things of God, but excuse me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Christians, we serve a God who can read hearts. And that is scary because he knows our motives and he cares about our motives. We can fool everybody by the way we dress, the way we talk, but we can't fool God. A question that we must ask ourselves is what are we after? And a way to understand that is here are some questions you can ask yourself. What makes you upset? What do you spend most of your time doing? If we saw your bank account, what would it tell us about you? What are you denying yourself so that God can be glorified or so that someone can know, come to know Jesus and be saved? Are you concerned with the things of God or the, the things of men? We are Americans, so we all want to experience the American dream, dream we live for, we plan for it. And, and don't forget our rights as well. You know, we sing songs like this world is not our home, but if you mess with our rights, we'll show you it really is our home. Jesus tells his followers to follow him. Then he dies on the cross. He's resurrected three days later. So the battle, the battle's been won against sin and death. And then he gathers his disciples in Matthew 28. If you could turn to Matthew 28, just really quickly, it's a couple pages over. Just want to read what Jesus says. Matthew 28 verses 18, going down to 20. Matthew 18, going to 20, he says, he's, this is right before his ascension, right before he leaves. He says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. For the Christian, a disciple of Christ, this is your new life. We are becoming more like Jesus uh, and we're on mission for Jesus to see more people come to know Jesus, to be saved from the wrath of God. It's like Jesus never left because Jesus is still working through us and living through us, drawing others to himself because the spirit lives in his children. We are the hands and feet of Jesus on earth, not using our hands and feet to grab more of this world, to run towards more of this world, but using our hands and feet to move toward more glory for God. Paul says in Colossians 2.12, we are buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. 
That's why we are baptized. First, Jesus told us that Christians who claim to be Christians will be baptized. It's a picture of what has happened to us. So when we go down into the water, we are reenacting Jesus dying on the cross and being buried in the grave. What we're saying is that our old lifestyle, our old ways, our sinful nature is dead. And when we come up out of the water, it's like when Jesus rose from, rose from the grave. And now we are, are going to walk in newness of life. So Jesus is alive and we are alive walking in the new life and new ways. And the spirit is changing us to become more like Jesus every day until we die. Or until Jesus returns. And by the grace of God, we get to see this happen this morning for some folks. Before that happens, though, let's finish this. Verse 26. For what, what profit? This is Jesus still speaking to the disciples, getting at the heart. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Verse 27, for the son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. That was Matthew 16, verse 26 through 27. I'm going to read verse 27 again. For the son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels, and then he will reward, every, reward each according to his works. So how do you know you lived a life a truly full life? Well, the question is, did you eat of the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ? Did you accept the, the offer of salvation from Jesus, who is life? You know, Jesus is light to life. That's how it's described in the scriptures. So if you're living for yourself and you're living for material things, you are actually walking in darkness. But to turn from this life to Jesus, to place your faith in Jesus, this means you are walking in the light. And here's what we know about light. It always overcomes darkness. Our text says in verse 27, he will reward each according to his works. So soon it will be Christmas and we will be celebrating when Jesus came to earth. I can't wait. My favorite time of the year, right? We're going to be celebrating. But I want you to remember this as we're celebrating Jesus coming to the earth. Remember that the first time Jesus came to the earth, he came to sinners and he gave sinners everything they didn't deserve. A way to escape salvation. I mean, a way to escape the wrath of God by salvation. He gave sinners everything they didn't deserve. But when Jesus comes back. According to this text, he's going to give everyone everything they deserve. For the Christian, we will, we will be with Jesus, but as, as well, he's going to look at our life. Did we live for ourselves? Did we live for his mission? And for those that do not know him, he will, he will look at them and say, did you receive the, the salvation that was provided through my son, his precious blood? Did you receive that or did you reject that? For those who do not know Jesus, a scripture tells us that God will pour out his wrath on all who have denied his son and rejected his offer of salvation. And that we beg you to repent, to turn to Jesus, to turn to the son of God, who is worthy to be lived for, who is eternal. His word is eternal. This world, it's material things, this glory and pleasure. It will not last because uh, scripture tells us Philippians chapter two, that when Jesus returns, every knee will bow to the true king. And give praise and worship to the true king. And those who believe they are the true kings of themselves will also bow to Jesus. And so my, 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 my heart, my concern for you, my, my, my plea for you is that you would turn to the true king Jesus this morning. The text asks, what have you exchanged your soul for? For most, the answer is money and pleasure. It's not worth it. 
But Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. He is our true king. And he has done everything so that you can know him and be right with him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we went through this text really quickly. And I thank you that you were always honest with your disciples. I thank you that you, you, you um, pointed out to Peter that Peter didn't even know that Satan was using him by making Peter only care about the things of men, the things of mankind. Lord, Satan has blinded the world to your goodness and your love. And Father, it is your word and your spirit that opens the eyes of sinners. And so I just pray that in this room right now, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, you would open their eyes to your goodness, that they are not gods. But they, when they die, they will stand before the one true holy God. And you will ask, did they accept the salvation that you provided? Jesus lived a perfect life, a life that we couldn't. He, he stood in our place. He took the wrath that we were supposed to take. He died on a cross. Buried. Rose from the grave three days later. And what that signifies is that the payment for our sins was paid. That you accepted it, God. That man could be right with you if they just placed their faith in your son. Agree with your son. Agree with you that we are sinners and ask for forgiveness. Jesus paid it all. Jesus did everything for us. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, I pray that they would be saved today. Be turned from your sin today and turn to Jesus so that you can know true peace, which is peace with God. Which is the most important decision you're ever going to have to make in your life. And Father, I thank you for those who are going to be baptized this morning, who have turned from the world and said, listen, I want to show the world that I know you. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for baptism that you allow us to even do that, Lord, to stand with you. I thank you that you call us brothers and sisters and family, even though we don't deserve it. Father, I thank you for this text, and I pray you would be with us for the rest of this service, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.